Turvy tomato. Who has a topsy turvy tomato? <laughs> when they first came out, I went, you know, listen, okay, if God would have wanted tomatoes to grow upside down, he would have had to do that. I don't understand why we want to do that. What I did is I bought all my topsy turvies this year. I went to the store that's over there in Carson called Big Lots. And I bought them for a buck a piece. Me too, me too. Did you? Yep. Yeah. And and so what happens is, uh, I, I'll lead to this. I actually have an outline, Steve. This is really cool. Uh, in fact, <laughs> to keep me on track today, especially, look at it, it's in a folder. Could you pass these out? To it's me? not wet. Everyone? No, it's, it's dry. Uh, anyway, it's called Grow More. That's what we're going to talk about. So that tomato that grows in the topsy-turvy planter is growing down and uh, who read The Secret Life of Plants, the book, it's called The Secret Life of Plants. You should read that. Yeah, I talked to my dad about that the other day and he went, oh, pull. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Secret Life of Plants, Poland's the guy that wrote it and he talks about losing his wallet while he's at the grocery store, and he had his plants hooked up to an electrocardiogram, kind of a lie detector concept, and when he reached for his wallet, it would be like me when I reach for my cell phone and it's not there, it's like, huh, a moment of panic. His plants registered that at home when he went to pay for his groceries and didn't have his wallet. So the plants understand something. They think, so topsy-turvy tomato, they expend a tremendous amount of energy trying to grow a pot. So my buddy Dale Savage, he and I grow garlic every year. We have this competition. In the first year, he told me to plant. I swear, he told me to plant it with the pointed end of the garlic down. That's the bulb of garlic, you know, the pointed end, which means it was upside down. And so his garlic is up and thriving, and mine is. I'm going. What I have wrong with my garlic? Well. All of them grew in a J because it had to grow in a J to come up. So the plants understand. That's why a weed seed will stay in the soil for as long as it needs to before it senses how close it is to the surface of the soil so that it can germinate and get to the life-sustaining energy of the sun before it runs out of energy. So every time you till your garden, you expose new weed seeds. And if you buy compost from Full Circle, then you can blame us for your weeds. Because oh, I put this compost in my garden and all these weeds came in. So um, 
we're going to talk about more. Uh, more is better most of the time, right? Uh, I need an outline to see what I'm doing. Uh, here we are. It's a good thing I have one. Uh, so, has anybody ever heard that mo, mo beta? Mo beta. I started to think about that. In fact, Steve and I talked about it on the on the phone, and I thought, wow, that's cool. As I started to ponder what I was going to talk to you folks about, one of the problems we have in American agriculture is this this issue of how we get paid. We milk cows for years here in Carson Valley, and. Uh, the way I could make more money is get more gallons of milk per cow. The volume always out yielded income wise the quality. So in milk, the dairy business, you get paid for quality. A Jersey cow gives you milk with lots of solids and it makes a higher yield of cheese. We milked Holstein cows and they gave us more volume. So we were getting 10 gallons of milk per cow per day. Okay? That's a lot of milk, 27,000 pounds of milk per cow per year. How did we do that? That aspect of my life, that was back in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. We were the top producing dairy herd in the state. We didn't use BST, that nasty hormone. We just fed them very well, and we took really good care of them. So they had shelter. They weren't getting rained on. They had a shed. So I started to think about what my cost was, and my biggest cost was the food we fed the cows. And we started to, uh, what farmers love to satisfy iron deficiencies by buying tractors. That's what we do. And uh, I noticed that a lot of men in general buy lots of iron. You know, you have a shop, and... Uh, you know, you buy a saw, and you buy all these tools, and yet the, the, the lady of the house typically has really bad knives in the kitchen, but they're the tools of the trade. So I still have my Cutco knives. In fact, we were using a Cutco slicer today to slice tomatoes that I purchased in 1976 as my demo kit for Cutco cutlery. So uh, maybe if you guys need a tune-up on your Cutco knives, I could still uh, do that. Anyway, got to keep on track, so I have an outline. Oh, I'm kind of hungry. I need a little boost. So, um, interestingly enough, uh, there's a process here. Now, just to make this easy, uh, and the wind has not been gracious to us, uh, this is wilted basil. Okay? Pretty good sized leaf. Here's how it works. You take a leaf of basil. Okay, and you can just pass that plant around. Uh, and then I'm gonna pass these cherry tomatoes around. Now you can take your choice. This is, uh, they call these bracts. This is the way cherry tomatoes grow, when you grow them right. And uh, so it's easier for us when we pick and wash to cut the whole thing off than pick individually. And so they all kind of do that. This is sun gold, this is chocolate cherry, this is Matt's wild cherry. This is a current tomato. Okay, and so what I like to do is I take a leaf of that basil and it's kind of like making sushi. I can lay that out and I put a, uh, and I don't know, you just have to use your fingers. Uh, if you need to clean them, just lick on them. And <laughs> so anyway, uh, no, I don't know you this food sanity thing. We had to get a $50 permit to slice tomatoes today. I have to have a three wash system. Uh, but the guy at the health department said that he probably wouldn't be here. So I said, well, do I really need to give you my 50 bucks then? Anyway, uh, look at that. You have this little thing. So then you take your gum out and you put it on the top of the, the camera. And I'm gonna put it up here in this bag of mine. Yeah. Then you have a mite. Yeah. This, okay? Mm. Ready? Mm. I'll just have the whole thing. Oh my god. <clears throat> that is so good. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I don't think you can buy that. You can't buy the flavor, you can't buy any of that. 
And, and the best place to experience is out in the garden. It's even better when you're out there and you just pull it off the plant that's growing. Uh, so anyway, that's what I did. I cut it off and I tried to bring it here. So uh, we'll pass that snack around. Then I bought some other stuff. I do have worm wine. Uh, we're going to give a few things away. Uh, but uh, looking at my outline, excuse me. There is a word, and since I've been being recorded, <laughs> where'd those tomatoes go? We invented this word, and that is the experience. A lot of people have not tasted a, a sun gold. Sun gold is a very sweet tomato. And uh, a little bit later, we're going to look at the mechanics of how you can tell the quality of your food. It's way down here. Is, is it working? Item number six. But what I know is when I taste this, there's something that happens. Now, sometimes you have to have these in private, but this is a good, it's, it's okay to have a tomato gasm in public. And uh, my wife is probably saying, did you really say that? But there is such incredible opportunity in your backyard to grow incredibly nutritious food that you can actually experience something like a tomato gasm. And there's different styles. And uh, when I'm in my garden, I can even make noise if I want to. Okay? So um, more is always better in most cases. My problem is balance. Okay? Um, I don't drink real beer anymore. I drink NA beer because uh, more was better. <laughs> so uh, there are certain things that we want enough of. Uh, I would imagine that you could have too many tomatoes. My wife said last year that 80 tomatoes varieties was too much, so I cut back to 45. So, you know, I'm getting there. Um, what are you going to do, and, and I think why you're here is you want to learn, like I am trying to learn, how to do a better job of growing food in my backyard. Why do I want to do that is one of the first questions I have. And for me, it's because, and this might be strong language, but I'm tired of getting lied to. And one of my experiences was I'm at an organic conference where we're dealing with organic growers, and I'm at a lunch, and I'm having lunch, and I'm not purposefully eavesdropping, but I'm overhearing a conversation about when these organic growers were faced with a situation where they had to grow. So they're certified organic, and we're buying organic food because they aren't spraying with a chemical. And they had a significant insect problem, and they were going to lose a crop. They had no income if they lost a crop, so they sprayed. That's what I heard them talking about. You know, well, I just had to spray, and so like I broke the rule. Well, we all sin on a regular basis, and so thank goodness God gives us some forgiveness for that. Or gives you the opportunity. If you don't know who God is, he's the guy that brought the rain today to draw you in here so you can listen to me talk. All right? That's cool. So anyway, um, and if you want to know more about that, you can see me later after we go to, this is kind of like the church of soil, so to speak. So what you need to do if you're going to start growing anything is you need to choose the right variety. Okay? So an example of that is this current tomato. And another example is, let's see here, I happen to have a tomato picking device in my back pocket. The wire cutters. Uh, this tomato, oh, is that going to be fresh? Look at that. I'll probably dry it off. I think tomatoes, did you know they call these love apples? There's a book on tomatoes and they were nicknamed love apples. They're in the nightshade family. So that means if I eat this plant, it will kill me. It's poisonous. So uh, the tomato originated South America. The explorers that came over here took it back to Europe. And they named them love apples because any time you dealt with something that uh, had potential to, uh, I guess, uh, you know, maybe partially poison you or something, it had something to do with romance. I don't know. You know. But anyway, they called them love apples. Uh, look at that, it has a navel. Is that pretty? I mean, 
first of all, if you don't grow anything in your backyard, you won't get to experience looking at a, something that's this pretty. Now, this is supposed to be a black pineapple, according to my label. Okay, and I'm going to, well, I'll leave the stem on, but usually I cut the stem off shorter because if you stack your tomatoes, this pokes the neighbor, you know? So that's why we took the horns off our milk house when they were babies because they, I mean, maybe, you know, once you're a dairy farmer, you're just messed up for life. Okay? But I'm going to pass this around, uh, but first I'm going to weigh it, put it on my scale here. So there we have a pound and a quarter, okay? So that's not bad. Now, the thing is, is that I'm counting. Now, you see this pot? I call that a, uh, honestly, it's a 10-gallon pot. They, they call it a 20 in the nursery business. That's so that we're freer with our money. Uh, if you've only had the orange tomato, you need to have one of these current ones. It's a different one of those kind of, oh, my gosh, it's different. Um, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, I'm just going to cut another one of these. I'm, I'm making a point here, and the point is, is that that great big tomato fits a slice of bread really well. Um, anybody have bacon? Yeah. Let me sell selling bacon here. We should be having BLTs. Here, let's pass that one around. Look, that one kind of has a navel too. That's interesting. I honestly don't know. I think this might be a uh, this might be big rainbow by mistake. We have inmates that work with us at the prison, and they are not very conscientious when it comes to labeling our seedlings. <laughs> this is not black pineapple. Okay, I, we have those out there. Did you all taste tomatoes in our booth outside? No. no. Okay. Well, you missed it. Okay. Usually you have to pay money to go to Tomato Fest down in Carmel uh, or to that winery. Anybody been to the winery where they have tomato tasting? No. You're missing out. Gosh. Okay, it's expensive though. That's what I heard. And this one, last time I checked, was free. It's crazy. It's a lot of work to put it on, but it's so satisfying. At least for me. Which, which winery? Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember the name of the winery. Uh, one of our customers goes all the time. It's really great. They have about 60 varieties. Did somebody say they knew the name of the winery? Google. What city okay. is it? Yeah, what winery? It's in uh, Napa. Oh. Yeah. Everything in Napa is expensive. So, Craig, okay. I think so. a lot of my tomatoes have this on the bottom. What does uh -huh. that mean? Well, that is a characteristic, I think, to the tomato. Oh, it is. Okay. Uh, let me see if there's... There is a... Uh, uh, I wouldn't call that blossom end rot. Uh, you can get blossom end rot, which looks like a scar, and that's uh, a lack of calcium. And it's caused by no calcium in the soil, uh, or it's caused by inadequate watering because water is necessary to move calcium. Okay, So it's calcium related. The way to fix it is you have to know how much calcium is in the soil. So the point I'm making is this is not, uh, it doesn't mean that I can't, find blossom end rot on any of these tomatoes. There really isn't any. Well, imagine that. I made the soil that is in there. That's um, yeah, a little bit of blossom end rot. So that's a little calcium deficiency. So um, this is a potting mix we make. And I had a sign, uh, here it is. We've replaced 90% of the peat moss we use when we make potting mixes with this product. Tahoe pine peat. So we recycle locally. We've been doing it for 15 years. It was really cool to have South Tahoe Refuse here, uh, Douglas Disposal. They're a garbage company. Uh, they run the MRF up at South Lake Tahoe. California has regulatory laws about uh, how they recycle in California. Nevada has none, so we don't do anything. Except for you guys. You're here at a green living event. You're learning and doing things. I recycle a lot because it's important to do that. But we have a big fat landfill called Lockwood Landfill. And everybody just, you know, puts their garbage in there. And so we don't really recycle. Although Douglas County is the has the highest recycling rate of any other county. 
well, let me think. Full Circle Compost started, and we diverted, and then Bentley started, because I worked with Bentley, and so they divert, and then Genoa Trees came in, and he saw me do it, and he thought he'd do it, and so there's three people composting, so, gee, I wonder why we have such a nice high diversion rate. Hmm, don't know. So what happened is the forest caught on fire, and the pine needles, they figured out, burned. Uh, we had a flyer. They all blew away in the wind. Uh, but the university did a trial on our fertile mulch, and it is the most fire-resistant wood mulch on the market. In the process of doing that trial, they actually had pine needles in the trial. Steve, were you at the trial? I was not. But you have the brochures at the extension office, and we have them if you're interested. Our uh, fertile mulch is the most fire-resistant wood mulch around. Pine needles were one of the most flammable second to rubber tires. I never recommend rubber tires as mulch. Just, that makes sense to me. Uh, but anyway, uh, the pine needles now are being diverted from Lake Tahoe. And this year there's a huge yield because the trees are dropping needles like crazy because we are in a drought. We have developed a unique compost recipe that allows us to keep that there. And we're mimicking peat moss, but yet guess what? Where's peat moss come from? Hmm? Peat bog. Yeah. Where are those? Wetlands. Wetlands. Yeah, most of them in Canada. Let me think, let's just drive to Canada. Let's just drive to Lake Tahoe. Hmm. Which one's closer? <laughs> Which one would save us some fuel, energy, some gas emissions, yeah. you know? I mean, I don't really need to use peat moss if we can make Tahoe pine peat. So it actually has more nutrition in it than peat moss. It's not as acid, but we put it in this mix and this pot is growing, uh, well that biggest one was a pound and, what did we say, pound and a quarter? Mm -hmm. And so these are like all half pounders and I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine half pounders is four and a half pounds and that other one is five and a half. So probably total if we let them mature, you got about six pounds of tomatoes coming out of this little pot. That tells me the energy is balanced. Now there's another kind of pot that's being grown. <laughs> And that one actually pays really well. And uh, some of you might have a permit to grow some of that in your closet. What I can tell you is the biggest pot plants that I've ever seen and the biggest pot plants that some of the uh, medicinal growers have ever seen are growing in Tahoe Pine Peat potting mix made right here. So I think I need you collectively to help full circle compost be a financial success in America by promoting the Tahoe part, right? We Tahoe pine peat and then we can give back to Lake Tahoe for having the best mail order, medicinal, mood enhancing, growing media on the market. <laughs> and I'm on TV. <laughs> nice. I don't know. Anybody know Chris Bentley? Yeah? So maybe. I mean, I'm just thinking about investments. Okay. So, we did a good word for farm okay? <laughs> All right, so where are we on the outline? Oh, you have to pick the variety. So if you're going to grow a tomato and you're looking to make a, a BLT, this is what I would want. And if I bought a Matt's Wild Cherry and I didn't get, I think, Big Rainbow, pick the right variety, OK? So that's what I'm going to tell you. And then the other thing is days to maturity. Now, when I started farming and gardening, that was like 50 years ago. I worked with my grandmother and my mother on Milky Way Farm. I was in the garden because that's where little kids went when you didn't have babysitters on a farm. And you weeded. And we had lots of weeds because we were dairy farmers and we used lots of cow manure. And so I started to understand things. And in fact, my first garden that I had myself I left the traditional garden location because my dad's answer to fertility in the garden when my mom would say, things aren't growing, Herb, things aren't growing very well, he would take the tractor and scoop up yet another scoop of cow poop and dump it in there, like there's magic in cow poop. And what I learned was is that that wasn't working. Okay, So I went to the pasture where the sheep were. But we didn't feed the sheep in the pasture. They were only there in the summer when there was grass. And what I learned is critters that poop fertilize correctly when they're grazing. Because when the grass runs out, guess what? They run out of food. They run out of poop. So 
the right amount of manure to use in your garden is what the density of a cow-calf operator could use. When you look at these pastures in Carson Valley, you can have one cow-calf pair per acre. Am I right? Yes. Maybe if you're really doing improved pasture, you could do two uh, cows per acre. That 43,560 square feet, this whole event was in about the size of an acre. That doesn't mean you're stepping on manure that's three or four inches deep. In fact, you can see the cow pies, okay? There's an article, you go on the website and you can look at it. I asked my grandfather, how come the cows don't eat that tall green grass and they're grazing this really short grass? And it's about the kind of energy that's in that grass and they will refuse instinctively to eat that real, real tall green grass around the cow pies in the pasture. That's why my job was to drag the pasture, to break the manure up and spread it out. It never made sense to me. My grandfather would say, it's because they don't want to put their face next to their poop. Okay, and that made sense, and so I, I didn't think about it anymore, but then they asked me to write this article the other day for the Landscape Magazine, and I had known this. I didn't learn it in college. I learned it outside of college, but, but it's about instinct in the animals knowing that there's too much nitrogen, and that creates urea, and it makes them sick. Now what we do agriculturally is that we get paid by yield, so we use too much nitrogen, but we're not involved in the growing process, so we bag it, and that's why the commercial spinach you buy oftentimes rots in your fridge in two days. If it's rotting in your fridge in two days, it means that it's not delivering the correct nutrition to you, and it's why you don't feel good, you're not satisfied, and then you begin to eat more. And that's another reason why more is not always better, because if the nutrition's balanced in your food and you eat it, you're satisfied. I don't know, uh, does anybody want another shot of basil and a tomato? I feel a little nutritional boost. I mean, feel free. I'm going to whip out some crackers and some, uh, uh, what, which, what should we have? Bread and butter pickles or some of Farmer Craig's chutney? Chutney. Chutney. I think chutney, too. Hang on a second. I got to get further down here. Where's Steve at? Somebody's got to tell me how much time I have. I'm not seeing the clock. It's going to have an hour. Oh my gosh, we have so much time. Is there any questions yet? Question. Where'd you get your hat? <laughs> it. Uh, thank you for that. My wife says you're not going to wear that hat, are you? And I went, yeah. And it is pretty good, except uh, it strengthens your neck muscles. <laughs> Uh, I got it at a mountain man rendezvous. Okay, that's where you go act like pre-1860. And you dress up and you like stay dirty and and uh, they have, there's still a circuit. Uh, they didn't, did they have, uh, what's the one in Carson? No. They didn't have it this year. Kid right. Carson days. Kid Carson rendezvous. Yeah, I drove up there to secretly go buy more mountain man stuff uh, on Sunday and it was gone. It wasn't there. It was, what a bummer. There's an outfit that goes there and they have these hats. So it's actually, uh, to let you know, it's made by Sunbody Hats, uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, www sunbody, S U N B O D Y dot com. So you can order it. Just say, you need a big hat. Well, Part of the deal is, is that That's if you have a big like hat, you can grow big tomatoes. It's got some serious shade. <laughs> right. Okay. It's a shade structure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Question? Yeah, what's your process for collecting the, the, the pine needles? Oh. oh. And where do you collect them and then what do you do with them? Well, the process for collecting them is the homeowners uh, that live up there, they're trying to now protect their house. So they don't want this flammable material really close, so they rake it up. Uh, some folks up there have lawns and they rake that up. And then there's a procedure that as you rake your pine needles in the Tahoe Basin, uh, you put them in bags, plastic bags, okay? And then they go to the MRF, which is where they sort things, okay? Well, when you're raking pine needles, they come in so fast, they don't have time to sort them, so we receive them in the bags. And then we at our compost site open them. Every fifth bag, we find the six pack of cans of beer and or bottles of beer that they consumed when they raked their yard. Now, this is a clean green waste program, but yet uh, somebody doesn't quite understand that. And to accent it kind of like a little bit of Parmesan on top of your pasta, 
Usually there's an accompanied bag of dog poop in a plastic bag. <laughs> so my life in the compost business is all fun and games. Okay? So if that explains it, they're collectively raped, mostly. And then they go to South Tahoe Refuse, and we're the composting arm for South Tahoe Refuse. Okay? We also network with Douglas Disposal, and uh, we try to divert as much as we can. Anybody like wild horses? Yeah. You did almost everybody like wild horses. Tastes like chickens. Horses. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tastes like chickens. Tastes like chickens. That's true. We were in France. <laughs> we were in France, and, and I had, uh, I actually had some horse, and I didn't mind it. Um, dairy farmers were not particularly fond of horses, um, just because I had a four-wheeler. It was much simpler. But uh, we make compost over at the Mass State Prison. Uh, that's where the fire workers come from, the inmates that work on the fire crews. There is 4,000 wild mustangs housed there because they, uh, they are uh, not controlling their own population in the wild. Nevada has more BLM ground than anywhere else, plus the largest wild horse uh, population. We have mountains of horse poop. And the folks over there are saying, you know, get rid of it, Craig. I'm over there composting because I utilize some horse manure in our compost recipe. But let me think here. An analogy would be chutney. Uh, this chutney is apple <laughs> chutney, but it's got tomatoes in it. It's got currants in it. It's got raisins in it. It's got Craig's secret juju stuff in it. It's got mustard seeds in it. It's got red peppers, green peppers, onions, smoked onions. Ooh, it's smoky chutney. Can I make compost out of horse poop? No. First lesson in compost making, get a recipe. If I try to make compost out of horse poop, I end up with horse poop at the end. Everything bad in horse poop is just concentrated. Okay? So the point is to have something that's incredibly good, you have to have a really good recipe. So why I asked about horses, it's not on my outline. My wife would be saying, great, back on the subject. We need help to get rid of the horse poop. What we need is things to mix with it. We need carbon. We need more people to divert the wood waste that they're taking to the landfill. So if you recycle here at Douglas Disposal, there's a pile for green waste. We take green waste. Bentley takes green waste. The problem is, is that we're not getting near enough because the right ratio of horse poop to green waste and wood waste is no more than 20% manure total. So that means for every horse that's pooping, I need uh, like five times of something else to mix with the poop they're making to make good compost. Good compost because it's balanced. That's on my outline. I think it's next. Uh, oh, no, wait. We're going to talk about planting. Plant at the right time. Don't start your tomatoes outside now. Okay? <laughs> okay. Vibrate. That's my dad. should talk to him. Yeah, I'm going to have to decline. Sorry. He's 88. Uh, he is uh, like a super farmer. He's really a fun guy. He's checking up on me. He's going to say, what are you doing? Uh, usually I put him on speakerphone and so just keep talking. Uh, he enjoyed black pineapple tomatoes this year like no other time ever because I kind of came in and took control. He can't. He, he doesn't want to. He's a really good farmer, but he didn't want to learn what we've learned to do this in a pot. Okay, so uh, let's see, plant at the right time, start your transplants to extend the growing season. Kevin did a b beautiful job of you know, showing you a season extension. We use walls of water to grow tomatoes. Does anybody know what those are? Mm -hmm. yeah, pretty much. Uh, I just wanted to point out, what I learned this year is uh, everything I planted at the correct time, which is, uh, I say, the first week in May. You want to put your tomatoes out in the ground. Okay? I get great yields in pots like this, but I can get 100 pounds of tomatoes per plant in the ground. Why in the ground and not in a pot? Because my plants in the ground aren't limited to the root zone. This pot is limiting the production of this plant because it's only a foot and a half wide. Most nutrient exchange is occurring on the surface where the surface feeding aerobic roots are. I put my plant in a pot, it's forcing those roots now to go deep and not out. Because it can't, it hits the wall of the pot. Do you see what I'm saying? So you feed a pot different than you feed your plants 
in the ground. All right? But the key is, is get roots growing. God gave plants roots for a reason. I have roots. I know about roots because I had my wisdom teeth taken out about a month ago. And I'm still not totally healed. The older you are, the deeper your roots get. I yeah. thought you used to be a lot wiser. <laughs> I know. And I, I'm suffering. I'm not chewing my cheeks. I was going to have cosmetic surgery on the inside of my mouth because every time I would eat a tomato, I'd bite my cheeks. And I think it was because I, my, my cheeks were sagging internally in there, you know? So it wasn't worth the money. I mean, if I would have tightened up these wrinkles. And... Okay, sorry. Is it on the agenda? It isn't. <laughs> Use frost protection is, though. So we learned about that. Wall of water, and then get them in the ground at the right time. 30 days in a wall of water is about perfect, OK? We planted in January in a wall of water. Haven't lost a tomato, but it grows up and keeps freezing off. It grows up and keeps freezing off. You don't want to stunt that plant's potential. So typically, if you get them in the ground at a little uh, four-inch, you know, two-inch, three-inch transplant, uh, May 1st, in the wall water, it will live in there happily. And then by June, it starts coming out. And if it freezes back, you don't lose the plant. You just lose the part that freezes. But the key is you've grown 30 days of roots. That's where the nutrient exchange occurs. Now, what's next? Oh, plants have roots. <laughs> food quality is all about the quality of the soil and potting mix that your food is grown in. That's why they have roots. That's where they get exchanged. Now, one element they can get through the root better than any other, and that's calcium. Calcium is very important, yet uh, this dude named, uh, oh, it's in this book. A uh, big, thick book. If you really want to know what I know, you got to read this book about four times. You've got to get some sticky notes. And uh, the back of it's broke, but I know 409, page 409, is uh, that Chevy car that we had that we should have kept. It had a two-speed slush box. We could go 130 in the desert driving to Phoenix. Never drank beer in that car. Uh, Anybody ever have a 409? That was a good motor. You could put three two barrels on it. Fuel. Yeah, you have to have air fuel. Gee, it's in my outline. Air, water, food. Page 409 says uh, the amount of energy that you get from a soil when the soil's working properly is equal to. 2.2, it works out, I do some math. I don't have my glasses on, I'm too lazy to put them on. Uh, I should have had more carrots. I have a carrot in there, maybe if I need it, I'll fix my eyes. Um, I told you. Microorganism activity in one acre of soil uses the same amount of energy in soil preparation as 10,000 people would burn for the same period of time for the same work. Did you get that? How'd you like to have 10,000 people working in your garden? Okay. When you do the math, it comes out to 0.22 people per square foot. This room is 20 by 20. Out. So that's what? 40 square feet? So 0.22 400. times 4? 400 square feet. What's 0.22 times 400? That's a quarter of 400. 50? No, 100. 100. 100. No, it's 100. How many people are in here? I mean, we're comfortably crowded. Could you imagine 100 people in here? That's what you're missing if you don't take care of the biology of your soil. Okay? It says so right in this book. Yeah, we go out and we spray Roundup. We spray herbicides. We use, who uses weed and feed? Nobody knows about algae. Algae are single cell plants. If you're going to kill anything with a weed and feed, you're going to kill the algae. Air, how important is air to you? Let's find out. <laughs> it's hard for me to talk and hold my breath, but I can keep talking as I expend my breath. Those of you that are holding your breath, you're going to last for maybe three minutes, and you're going to pass out. Okay? If you don't get air, you're going to have brain damage, and you're going to die quick. Okay? You can go without food for a long time. Water? No. Three days. Three days. Common sense? I jump yeah. to the end. A lifetime. A lifetime. <laughs> It's weird how I'm getting through my outline by doing it in reverse order, but it just happened to come out. So now there's another part of this book that's very important for you. Are you guys organic? 
You yes. wouldn't be here if you were an Armenian. You wouldn't have the green I living if you were using Miracle Grow, for God's so. sake. <laughs> so anyway, in my journey of soil fertility, here's the story. I meet this Amish dude. He makes these compost turners. He went and saw Siegfried Lubke in Germany. They make compost that bioremediated the cesium fallout from Chernobyl. Hmm. Oh. Japan, we're see getting cesium in our food because of Japan. Maybe we should start composting in a better way than we're doing when the garbage companies that are composting now in California are sending garbage compost up here in bags to us to buy at Rayleigh's which is a grocery store, but it has compost. I can't believe it. So does Smith's. But Home Depot and Lowe's have it, too. Do you know where your compost comes from? Same way as you know about where your food comes from. Do the, How do they make it? Go on our website. You can see how we make it, fullcirclecompost.com. I meet Edwin. Edwin says, you know, this Siegfried Lutke, he knows how, knows how to compost. I meet these other guys. I meet this guy named Dave Larson that started AgriEnergy. Dave dies before I can actually shake his hand. Quite a visionary. And I meet this other guy named Charles Larson, and then I meet and hear about this guy named William Jackson. It's like, oh, he is all the scoop on organic growing. Why? Because he wrote a thousand-page book. I have this app on my phone that will record myself, so now I'm going to start writing my own book. I have to have glasses, sorry. Are you missing the photo? Wow, I have dirty glasses. Uh, these are called clicks, by the way. They're very nice. You don't lose them. I mean, buy them at the stove store in Carson City, over there where Ming's is. Okay. Uh, the guy that invented the modern chemical fertilizer theory of NPK is named Siegfried, no, Justice von Liebig is his name. He's German. And uh, anyway, in some letters, translations and observations from family members made available 1992 out of Switzerland, provided by Dave Larson, the founder of AgriEnergy Resource, and Charles Martin, his friend. They translated, this was translated to an unpublished memo. So the guy that invented this NPK thing, for you that don't know, NPK are the numbers on a fertilizer bag. Miracle Grow even has some numbers on it, okay? NPK stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So if you're using a 10-10-10 fertilizer, which every Home Depot employee is trained to tell you that's what you need in your garden, 10-10-10, they just magically know that that's what you need. You know, if you go somewhere else, they'll tell you something else. The one that really cracks me up is I go to Nevada Western Supply. They sell plumbing stuff. You ever been to Nevada Western Supply? Plumbing <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Guess what the landscapers are all using in your yard and garden if you're using a landscaper? Whatever's cheapest in Nevada Western Supply. I guarantee it. I always know when they don't know, I just go to Nevada Western Supply, figure out what's cheapest. That's what they're all using. Why? Because they have free coffee and donuts if you go in there. That makes sense. Yes, it's amazing. Uh, so what does this published mem unpublished memo, it has this uh, guy that invented the theory of fertilization as it exists still in the United States. Farmers use fertilizers, chemical fertilizers over and over again. He says, I sinned against the wisdom of our creator and received just punishment for it. I wanted to improve his handiwork, and in my blindness, I believe that in this wonderful chain of laws which ties life to the surface of the earth and always keeps it rejuvenated, there might be a link missing that had to be replaced by me, this weak, powerless nothing. In other words, what he said is, sorry, I screwed up. Okay? But yet, you people have not turned around because there's too much money in selling fertilizers. What's that got to do with growing more? You could grow more with fertilizers, but its nutrition is not there because the fertilizers don't support the biology. Okay? And it's the biology that goes there. So now, how many of you have heard of uh, 0715H E. coli? Pathogenic yes. E. coli, you heard of that? Are you afraid of that in your own yard or garden, being on your food and contaminating your food? No. Nope. You're not. Good. I'm a little afraid every time I buy a strawberry or every time I'm buying spinach these days, is it washed or isn't it washed? Is it washed and triple sanitized? You know, I don't want to die from being digested from the inside out. Guess who the sanitizers of our soil are? Mm -hmm. They're these little critters. They're in a bin out there. They're worms. Little guys. They eat bacteria, they eat pathogens, they sanitize our soil. Soil is the filter for the water we drink. It's very important. 
This guy, the inventor of the NPK theory, knew that because the creator made a system that sustains itself in spite of us. That's amazing. I mean, where's our clean drinking water come from? Carson City wasn't so swift. They drilled in these stupid places, and they have one in their water. It's not good for you. Arsenic. That kills you. High arsenic. Okay? If you pick the location, you could even douse for it energetically. You could drill where you're not going to have arsenic. So now what do they do? Well, it's a great thing for the town of Minden because Minden sells them clean water. Why is our water clean? Because we're in an agricultural ecosystem that is relatively unpolluted by modern farming techniques because it's mostly pasture land where these cows are pooping the correct amount for the fertility of what their manure has in it. But will you fix any nutritional deficiencies without knowing first what they are and what the balance is? No. Back to the outline. Plants have roots. Nutritional balance is the key. More than NPK. You got a whole bunch more than what my outline said. Uh, balance. 7 to 1 calcium to magnesium ratio. How much calcium is in your soil? If you get a lab analysis from a standard lab, it's not bad information. You've spent money. It gives you some guidelines, but it doesn't necessarily speak the language of a plant. If you're gardening and you're trying to grow any plant, whether it's a tomato, uh, what's this, by the way? Oh, look how my mind wanders. How much time do I have left? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Pass that around. Smell it. Does anybody, can anybody tell me right now what it is? It's in the mint family. Sage. Catnip. No, it's not catnip. My catnip. My cat goes crazy. We have this catnip plant. It's huge. She's just out there. She's out there. A different kind of cat. I don't know. I'm stuck in my head. Mm. Oh. Wow. It's mm. Tastes kind of like, yeah, it smells like a calming effect. Oh, notice how relaxed I feel now. You're welcome to eat some. The flour is especially good. If you take the flour, you need it. See my off one side? Yeah. Notice the stem. Is it Anna? No. There's a free jar of worm wine for anybody that gets it. Looks like last Close. I'll just give you this. Okay. You'll use it. Oh, yeah, it is. Hiss it. Hiss it. Now, guess what? Well, it tastes great. Right. I told you I was talking about it. Feel the stem. It's square. How many of you have seen a square stem plant? How's that work? That's crazy. I don't like squares. Full circle. Full circle. Full circle. Who <laughs> by, what is it? The, no, the lion? Uh, okay. So uh, is, I need a plate for, to put some. Uh, I have crackers and I have. Do we have anything that will serve like a plate that uh, put some chutney on it? I'm hungry. I need a goose. Uh, so anyway, hyssop. Guess what? When Christ was crucified on the cross, they dipped hyssop in vinegar, held it up, and said, Here, have a nice, refreshing drink of vinegar before you die. How nice that was. Well, why did they do that? Because of this rigid stem, and then this hyssop flower dries, and it's like a sponge. Pretty cool, huh? Imagine those things that you learn at a How to Grow More workshop. No, I'm not kidding you. It's in there. So I have a book about plants of the Bible, and it's really a cool one. And uh, the other one is frankincense, myrrh, you know, those wise men. Uh, I don't know if those wise men were farmers or not. Back in that day, you know, food is still really important. But we weren't blessed as we are now with food at our door all the time. Did you know we throw away 40% of our food before we even eat it? Did you know that, uh, what else is on my outline? Uh, average food travels 1,200 miles before you get it. These tomatoes came from Circle Drive and Gardnerville. 7.3 miles. Tall Pine Peak comes from Tahoe, not Canyon Top. Okay, so uh, where are we at on this thing? Mulch matters. Yeah, if you're not mulching, you have to mulch. Service feeding roots don't go where there's no moisture. Okay? So, so what do if you recommend, you, like, for a mulch? If, I mean, I know you make all kinds of stuff. Stuff. That's a beautiful sound. That is. That is the sound of a good seal. <laughs>
I'd like to hear him close. Oh, that is close. the smell of a good chutney. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this one's hot or not. So I just, I'm going to put some in here. Uh, if you hold that, then I'll pass the crackers out. We'll start it in two different areas. If you don't like chutney, don't eat it. <laughs> if you haven't had chutney, try it. If you think you don't like chutney, try, try it. <laughs> so there's some crackers. Uh, this was all I had with saltines. These are not my favorite cracker. Uh, chutney's better on a Ritz. It's even better if you put a little bit of extra sharp cheddar on top of the chutney. Oh, is that ever good? Now, one of the reasons it's good is that I didn't make, grow the grapes that made the raisins or the currants, because I can't. And ginger, I could have got ginger from uh, Custom Gardens in... Uh, where is it? Yeah. Did you know you could get your ginger there? Sorry, I have to try it. I think I'd make more money with a jetty than I could. <laughs> Talking for free at a green living. <laughs> okay. Uh, outline. Whoa, 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 whoa. Fully repeating. Okay. Mulch. Very important. Anybody that's not getting good results with our garden soil or in their own garden, our own yard, the farther out you get the tree roots to go, the better. So you go up to the Tahoe Forest, okay? And you go to the mountains over here where the pinions are. There's mulch all over, and that means the roots go because what moisture's there, the soil never gets bone dry. We see a 50% decrease in watering requirement when we use mulch. We make fertile mulch. Your question was, what can you use as mulch? You can use anything you want. So here's one of the problems with mulches. When you buy a recycled mulch, most people aren't bringing you plants that are healthy. They're bringing you dead plants. They died for a reason. Unless it's composted correctly, you have no sanitization to transfer disease. So this year, there's this little critter called a red mite. I don't know where the hell a red mite came from. I don't like the little buggers. You can't see them. So I haven't seen one. I haven't shook his hand. I want to kill him. Okay, I don't like them. We didn't get every tomato infected. Uh, there's you've got to talk to Hungry Mother. I think Mark knows more about the red mites. We think they came in the grafted tomato stock out of California. We know that sudden oak death got transferred all over the United States because of poor composting process. Okay, so I recommend that if I'm going to use a mulch in my yard, I'm going to use a mulch that's sanitized with the correct composting process. That means you got to be at least five days at 135 degrees. Guess what full circle temperature is? 40 days at 140. So 15 days at 135 is what certified organic regs call for. Let me think. Full circles, 40 days at 140. I don't really worry about all those regulations. You just do it right. Okay? So mulch, more roots. Bigger the area where you mulch. I love you guys when you plant trees and you make this little hole about this big and then you make a base in this big. And then you die and your kids take over and the trees still not big enough to make shade. Big basin. Big area mulch. Okay? Got it? Okay, that's not on the outline. <laughs> oh, is it working? That's on the outline. We're, are we there? What do you think? Fully, oh no, foliar feeding. Foliar feeding, for those of you who don't know, is plants can take nutrients through the leaves. Two bank accounts, okay? It's kind of like you and me. You all have debit card? Mm -hmm. Got a debit card. That's like my checkbook. Okay? When I swipe it, I yell, uh, I say something bad about my wife because she kind of like take care of that counting stuff. Must not have deposited in the right account because it rejects. When I go to the grocery store, my debit card rejects, declines. Do you get your groceries? No. Okay? So if your plant is there and it's trying to get something in the soil that you don't know whether you have too much or too little or not enough of, and it swipes its debit card to get its groceries and it's not there, it's declined. Is it happy? No. Okay? It doesn't matter what your soil test says if it's giving you a number that the plant doesn't understand. You can have all the calcium in the world or all the money in the world in your retirement account, but if it's not accessible, I'm going to go home hungry today. That means your plant's not going to get big. It's not going to be mold better. Okay? So, deposit in the right account. How can you help your plant? You put it in through the leaf. That makes the plant exude, excrete 
more exudates into the soil and it makes a larger withdrawal out of the soil bank account if you've deposited in that bank account. Oh, sounds like full circle fertility to me. I wonder if this pepper's hot. What do you think? You like hot stuff? Yes. Want to see if it's hot? You take it back. Yes. I'll do it. Oops, now I have to break it off to sanitize it. <laughs> I don't think it's hot. No. Oops. No. Anybody want pepper? Okay. We're going to do something here really quick. Uh, is it working? That's where we're at. How much time? Five minutes. One minute. One minute. Is it working? How can we tell? Refractometer. Pressure sucrose. How do you feel? I feel good. I felt better after having 47 tomato gasms today. <laughs> you know, sir. I'm probably going to delete that. The bragger. Oh, the bragger. <laughs> Got to get, you know, some kind of gasm. One way or another is good. All right. This is a refractometer. Now we have handouts. I'm sorry, another handout. Uh, here you go. Here's a chart. The guy that invented this chart. Dr. Kerry Reeves. Okay, can you pass those out? Sure, Steve. Thanks. James, how are you? That's James Good. over the corner. James is, uh, it, did the booth, did it disintegrate? Uh, kind of. Did it just like <laughs> blow, did you just let it go and it's back at the nursery? Almost. Okay. Yeah, it could have been. But could have been. Let me get that one. All right, so uh, that's a bricks chart. And then, uh, oh, I have one of these. It's the refractive Sorry. index of crop oh, juices, okay? Oh. And here's another handout, because uh, you're going to take this home. Your best place to deposit these handouts is in the bathroom near the toilet. Because while you're sitting there thinking about doing your business, uh, you can remember that you talked and heard about this stuff. Uh, I just happened to go online looking for nutrient-dense food, and I came up with the Weston Price Foundation. He's a dentist. He observed that people in third world countries have perfect teeth, and Americans have craft for teeth. I, I have to go to the dentist on Monday. Uh, our teeth aren't nearly as good as some other populations, so their diets are different. Okay? So Weston Price, he's started understanding more about nutrition. So read this thing. All these people in here, I know. Why do I know them? I didn't know I knew all these people until I read this article a day and a half ago. Okay? So it's a cool article. You go online, Weston Price Foundation. Uh, diets, everybody's on a different diet. Our neighbor's on paleo, and somebody's on this, and somebody's on that. Good food is what you want. You want to grow it yourself. You want to grow more of that. But the way the refractometer works, is the more nutrition in anything that you get, you put liquid on this lens, the more nutrition in it, the bigger the refraction of refracting sunlight. So sunlight comes through, it bends the light to a higher degree when you have some nutrition in there. So on a pepper, for instance. You want your grapes? Oh, I have grapes too. I'm just curious on this pepper. So two drops of juice, okay? That little plastic thing smears it out. Now I look through here. And uh, what do I see? So who can see pepper on that bricks jar? Okay. See it? Okay, so 8 to 10 is good. Hot peppers, uh, it looks like it's about the same, 8 to 10. This one actually is only reading about a 7, okay? I'm going to pass it around. When I tasted it, I could correlate that it isn't my favorite of the peppers. Uh, honestly, I don't know if it's a hatch or not. It has a little heat. It's a little sweet, but it's not a caramel de toro. Again, pick the right variety. If you want a sweet pepper, grow a sweet pepper. If you want a hot pepper, grow a hot one. Great, thank you very much.